All right, so uh, welcome everybody uh, to Success Tips for New Supervisors. Uh, today's presenter will be Terry Koslowski. Uh, she's been with her a broad experience in a variety of client cultures where she has led transformation and technology adoption projects to support the business and strategic decisions there. Uh, during the decade, she has served as an account manager, a project manager, a program manager, uh, an organizational uh, change architect in more than 30 separate initiatives. So she's well versed in the subject matter and uh, I really hope that you enjoyed the presentation today. Uh, Terry, take it away. All right, thank you, Scott. So we're going to talk today about uh, success tips for new supervisors. And this is intended, um, on, there we go intended for both new and experienced supervisors. And the intention is to give you some tips to help you handle your job. I mean, you, you have, everyone acknowledges that the job of a first line supervisor is really challenging. Um, you know, in that role, you are clearly directly responsible for your workers and their performance. So the way that we're going to go about sharing some of those tips today is, first of all, to ground us, review 14 of key responsibilities that supervisors have just very quickly. Then we're going to ask you to vote on which of the 14 you actually want to discuss in more detail. And we will also provide some time at the end for you to bring your questions or your problem situations in order to get some practical advice. So don't feel constrained by the 14 that we're going to lay out here. There may be other things on your mind. And if so, we definitely want to um, identify what those are and, you know, send you, uh, send you away at the end of this hour with, uh, with some, uh, some new strategies and some new thoughts to, uh, to address those. So as we move, as I said, we definitely want to uh, bring your specific questions and your problems. So as we're going through this, feel free to go ahead and write them in the webinar in the area where the questions can be added. So, you know, you see uh, hopefully that you have the ability to go ahead and pose a question, go ahead and um, enter it there. We probably won't be looking at them, at least I won't be looking at them. Maybe Scott as my moderator will be able to take a look at them, but um, at the end he will definitely make sure that I have all of those in order to be able to address them. So if things come up as we're going through this that, that trigger additional questions or follow-up questions in your mind, feel free to write those in as well. So in terms of the 14 areas of responsibility, first one is simply work scheduling, right? <laughs> Making sure that in fact, all that has to be done gets done. We also wanna talk about assuring the quality of the work, both in terms of accuracy as well as service. So it's not just that you know the work is being done, but is it, work at the right level to meet the requirements of your customers, whether they are internal or external or both. Certainly, as a supervisor, you're responsible for giving specific work assignments to people, being aware of who is um, skilled or perhaps who needs to be given the opportunity because it will be a way for them to develop uh, some of the skills um, uh, that they need to uh, to have or that you want to have from a cross-training perspective, something else that is one of your responsibilities. Then we get into a whole series of pieces having to do with personnel, right? personnel, human resources, with, you know, whatever we choose to call it. Um, most of your time is spent really working with people that work directly um, under your um, under your direction. So the first area is both dealing with the hiring and the selection in terms of bringing people into your organization or into your group, as well as the actual termination uh, in terms of when someone needs to leave in terms of 
uh, you know, the end of, of their, uh, their time with, uh, uh, you know, with your organization. So that's the first piece, uh, you know, getting people in the door and basically getting people out of the door. A lot of people find this to be, particularly if they're a first-time supervisor, one of the more challenging aspects of the job because it's not something that is uh, specific to perhaps um, content or subject matter knowledge of the doing of the job. A lot of people get promoted into first-line supervision because they were excellent at doing the work of the group. Uh, but this is a piece that, that requires a slightly different set of skills. So sometimes people find this particularly challenging. The other aspect is, okay, now that you've got them and they have been hired or you have accepted them into your group if they're an internal transfer, that we have all of the orientation and training that needs to be done, um, doing their reviews on a periodic basis so that they understand how you are assessing their performance, what they can do to improve, and also what it is that you acknowledge that they are perhaps particularly gifted at or or um you know bring bring particular talent uh and ability to so that people are aware and that it's not just a what are you doing wrong but it actually is an affirmation of things that you appreciate and want to encourage them uh in regards to in terms of their skills we also have the counseling aspect. Uh, oftentimes in your role, you may be put in a situation where you need to talk about the um, personal problems they may be having. Now, not because you are seeking this out, but because often because of your role, they may come to you and ask for your advice or you know, uh, look for your counsel to help address something that they are um, struggling with and, and need some guidance on. So sometimes you get pulled into those situations. And another aspect is what we're calling downward communication, which is basically you as the supervisor are the person that communicates key messages in regards to you know, what the organization is doing or why the organization is making a change or what is now needed or perhaps how the company is doing overall, maybe a number of different kinds of messages you may be asked to send. But again, you are the key communicator. There was a study done recently in which they asked people how they preferred to receive communication and the highest percentage by an overwhelming amount was people wanted to hear things from their direct and immediate supervisor. So you're in a critical role in regards to providing that kind of counsel. Certainly, as a supervisor, you're responsible for cost and productivity improvements. It's not enough to just you know, get the job done, but also what can be done to do that even more effectively and even more efficiently and free up some of the resources, whether it's dollars or whether it's people's time, which is always a scarce resource on uh, areas that are going to have the greatest impact in terms of meeting both the personal goals as well as the organizational goals. So that brings us to continuous improvement. Uh, again, it's the concept that wherever you are at, what is the next area of focus? What, what can we do? Um, people like to work for organizations where they feel that they're making progress and that things are getting better. So, uh, you know, what are those things that from the standpoint of you know, yes, this is the way we're doing it today, but what can we do that would make it even better, whether it's in terms of people's personal um, um, activities or how work is scheduled or uh, how work assignments are handed out or how meetings are held. You know, there it could be really any aspect, but anything that you can do to help them be more effective in their job and in their role is certainly what you want to be paying attention to as part of your personal responsibilities as a supervisor. So 
security clearly is an uh, obligation that particularly in this day and age uh, takes front and center prominence in regards to a safe workplace, uh, you know, not just from a, a health and safety perspective, but, you know, frankly, from the standpoint of, you know, violence and security of the premises and security of all of the online equipment that may be subject to viruses or attacks uh, from the outside, you know, paying attention to uh, ensuring that the proper security procedures are not just established, but are also in place and being followed by people is is a key aspect of uh, a supervisor's responsibility as well. Which, again, I, I think of safety and security as, as sort of the, you know, two, two halves of the same coin, but from a safety standpoint, uh, you know, there may be specific things in regards to the workplace in regards to, you know, procedures and the use of safety glasses or the use of uh, people not standing on chairs in order to, you know, get at something from a higher shelf or something. You know, it, the, the, there, there are so many aspects. But again, it's part of that keeping everyone in your organization in an environment where they are protected from harm and from things that could go wrong, even if it's through their own, um, you know, carelessness or thinking, well, it doesn't matter. I can just, you know, go ahead and do this. Make it, making sure that people are attentive to that would be something that I suspect you are already paying attention to. Coordination with other company groups. Again, as the supervisor, you are the person that often will be the liaison with the rest of the organization and with the uh, different uh, objectives or requests or needs of the other uh, components of the organization, all serving that greater goal of both meeting the client's objectives as well as meeting the um, you know, I say client, customer, you know, and we're, we're talking about supervision in a, in a generic sense in that we're not just talking about, you know, a, a, you know, manufacturing or a factory floor operation. You know, even if you're a knowledge worker, even if you're, you know, a supervisor in an office setting working with, you know, high tech people or in a, uh, you know, government uh, setting where you have responsibility for uh, service to the public and a group that provides that. Um, all, all, all of the communication to your people generally will come through you. So you're being able to reach out and make sure that you are providing the necessary um, uh, communication and communication opportunities so that you are plugged into how the work coming out of your group connects to the larger picture and the overall needs of the other groups is another key responsibility that you have. Which brings us then to outsiders. So outside the organization, whether it's the clients or whether it's uh, a vendor uh, that you may be coordinating with, or if there are uh, partners that you have uh, in an organization, again, making sure that you're aware of what are those points of contact and that your people are equipped and provided by you with the support that they need or perhaps the training they may need in order to effectively handle those contacts or if they should not be uh, participating directly in those contacts and you want that to be handled through a particular person or a particular team that is designated for that or for that information to come directly to you and for you to be the liaison, however it is that you want to handle it, that's another piece that you want to make sure you have addressed. Forward planning basically deals with looking at not just the 
uh, you know, the, the current needs and, and uh, responsibilities, but also looking ahead to what may be coming and what may need to be addressed and planned for in advance. So, for instance, you know, it's before the busy season that you need to make sure that you have proper staff or that staff is aware of what the um, change in schedules or expectations might be far in advance so that they can make plans appropriately. So again, whether it's whether it's resources or whether it's making sure that the proper uh, um, awareness is in place in regards to what's coming or what needs to be put in place based upon uh, what the expectations might be. This is where that coordination with the other groups um, it plays a role. You, you definitely want to make sure that that is in place as well. Self-improvement. So it's funny but we've spent most of our time so far talking about that you have a responsibility to address what other people are doing, but you also have a responsibility to yourself in terms of your own growth and your own development and making sure that you are bringing the pieces to bear that will allow you to continue to grow in your own skills and your own knowledge and your own understanding. And we'll be talking a little bit later about some of the pieces that we have put in place to assist you to, uh, to do that as an opportunity. We also highly recommend the fact that reading uh, or whether you're someone who prefers to listen to uh, information, books on tape, uh, you know, but occasionally picking up that item that will help give you some additional perspective or some additional guidance, um, you know, through through some outside training or through some outside um, professional organizations, those, again, is a responsibility that you have, in this case, to yourself in order to be your best self and bring your best self and your best capabilities and your most up-to-date understanding and knowledge to the job that you have. And for 14, we wanted to highlight motivating the top performer. Now, we had talked about the human resources needs in terms of you know, doing reviews and counseling people and making sure that you're providing people with the correct kind of orientation and training that they need to do their job effectively. But it's also important to recognize that you are usually in a position where people look to you and they want your approval and they want your guidance and they want you to acknowledge them. So, it's more likely that if you have someone who sees themselves as a top performer, that they're going to be looking to you to help them maintain that top performance and to help them both, uh, you know, continue to do what it is that they do well, uh, you know, improve any areas obviously that need to be, uh, you know, improved or, or just from a standpoint of their continuous growth and improvement. Not that it's necessarily a, a liability or that they're not at a performance level. But sometimes we want to help people to develop and grow those skills where they're already strong so that we actually strengthen the skills and we, we help people to become even more effective in the areas where they're already effective because that may be where they can provide some of the greatest contributions to, to their organization and also give them the visibility that they may need in order to advance and grow in their career. One of the key areas of responsibility as a supervisor is to develop talent, to develop and grow the capabilities of all of the people uh, within uh, your organization so that they can move on into even more challenging uh, roles and are, are, uh, are an even greater asset. So you're, you know, motivating your top performers or you're, you know, being able to identify who those people are that have the potential and giving them the kinds of situations that will allow them to demonstrate what their capabilities actually are and what they are capable of growing into 
would be a piece that you don't want to lose sight of in the crush of the day-to-day responsibilities and the busyness of just keeping uh, normal day-to-day going in terms of the operation. So those are the 14 key areas of responsibility. Certainly, supervisors have other areas of responsibility, but these seem to be the ones that we have found seem to cover the 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 ones that you know allow you to address whatever um, else needs to be added. Often, it falls under one of these major categories in terms of the um, in terms of the the key responsibilities. So, if we're talking about hiring and selection. One of the pieces is that, and and again, we're going to go into some greater detail here based upon the requests that I received. First of all, we have to define the job and the qualifications in your own mind. In other words, know what you are looking for before you actually start looking for someone. You also want to review your own people first you may be able to find someone else in the company that wants to come into your part of the organization or wants to take on the kinds of work challenges that your group does. So definitely looking from within is one of the pieces. Uh, You definitely, again, it says personnel in most organizations. It's now called human resources. All right, Apple, we will send this message away. Um, you definitely want to ensure that you are uh, following whatever guidance they provide in terms of how you're going to reach out for that information. Let us move to the next item, which is the part that most people find the most difficult, and that is termination. So, first of all, if you believe that someone actually needs to be terminated, you need to make sure that you are working very closely with the human resources area in terms of following the correct procedures. Uh, most organizations have requirements in terms of, of warnings that need to be given and notices. I mean, certainly there are some conditions and some circumstances that require a, a um, um, you know, or, or I should say, our immediate grounds for termination. But in most cases, you will not be confronted with that. In most cases, it's more that the requirements of the job are not a match with the ability of the person um, or their willingness to to actually perform that. So uh, make sure you're following what are the correct procedures. And, uh, you know, document as the uh, human resources area suggests, you know, what all the pieces are that you have done in order to attempt to have the firing and the termination be the last, last resort after everything else has been attempted in order to be able to bring the person to the level of performance that's needed. Um, again, if it's a layoff situation, uh, you will still be coordinating with the human resources area, so they will be able to provide you with guidance both in terms of messaging as well as what what has to be done. Uh, you know, certainly they will be coordinating with you in both of these situations, whether someone is fired or laid off. Often they will participate in that conversation with you so that there is a record and a witness in terms of what was said and how things were done. Uh, you definitely want to uh, cover that and then uh, make sure that uh, you, uh, after they are taken care of in terms of, you know, whatever their benefits eligibility that it will be and, uh, you know, making sure that they have turned in any keys or any kinds of equipment, taken their personal possessions out of the workplace. If you are a supervisor who is facing a situation where there has been a layoff, 
uh, you need to figure out how you're still going to get the work done. You may have fewer people. You may have fewer people at particular times or on particular days. So as part of your proactive planning, you want to identify what you might need to do differently or what adjustments need to be made or um, you know what can be done within your ability and your span of control and your ability to influence on your own uh, what might need to be approved um, by by your management in regards to you know if you want to for instance adjust the hours where uh, support will be available from your group that might be something that would need to be approved uh, by other people or the people who uh, would be relying on it and certainly by the people who would need to reinforce that communication in terms of, of, of that change. You know, certainly if someone is leaving on their own, again, you'll be coordinating with human resources, but sometimes organizations will designate someone outside the immediate group uh, often HR itself, to do a um, exit interview and get an understanding of the person in terms of, you know, what it is it that is the reason that they are leaving if they choose to share it. And certainly they're not required to do so. And pick up any suggestions or um, improvements that may be made that led to their departure so that those items can be, A, first of all, understood, and B, um, then communicated. So if you do happen to get any feedback from that sort of situation, uh, as, uh, you know, a human being, we're all defensive in regards to, you know, the way we work and the way we do things. But, you know, definitely pay attention to that feedback because there may be some very um, helpful suggestions coming through in that sort of situation and you you don't want to close your close your mind to that you want to make sure that you're you're actually um, listening and uh, taking appropriate action um, through through considering it with an open mind so let me see if some of his question has come in now through the question box so let me open up that panel Okay, let's see. Okay. Okay, so what uh, Abigail says is I'm supervising some staff that have more experience in another industry but need to report to me on a project we are working on together. They may come off as what do you know? We have more years of experience. Okay. So, so the question is, they may come off as, or you actually are getting that attitude. <laughs> that would be one of the first things to know. Because sometimes we we think that people are are not willing to accept our responsibility and our authority, and sometimes that is not actually the case. But so, what he says is he is getting that attitude. Okay, so. What I have found is effective in that kind of situation is to uh, position yourself as the facilitator in terms of, you know, it, just because you're the supervisor doesn't mean that you need to know everything, right? So if you are getting that, you know, attitude in terms of, you know, they have experience, then certainly asking them for their recommendations and bringing them into helping you shape the way things are done is sometimes a way to diffuse the situation because then they feel that their expertise is actually, you know, valued and 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 you are paying attention to them and you are acknowledging that, okay, you know, you say you have done this before. What have you found to be the most effective ways to do that? Or how do you recommend we do this? Or you know, you know, do you recommend that we do this differently? You know, and if so, why? So if you if you take the attitude that you are uh, are focused on pulling the best in terms of the capabilities and the experience and the guidance from everyone that is participating in your group, 
often that will be sometimes all people need. They just they just want to feel that you know their um, their experience is valued and is being paid attention to. And if it turns out that they come up with a suggestion for something that can't be done, either because you know it violates policy or because there has been a you know decision that it you know you know it can't be done that way. Um, you know, then then sharing that yes, you know that that could be you know something we could do, but uh, in fact, you know, management has made the decision that we need to do X for this reason, or you know, we need to go Y. So a lot of times it requires a lot of communication. It often sometimes requires one-on-one meetings with people. Sometimes people will posture in terms of a group setting and so sometimes it's more productive to meet one-on-one with someone and if the you know if the attitude um, and the behaviors and again attitude is one thing right we can't do anything about the way people feel or frankly entitled to feel whatever they're feeling but it's the behaviors that we want to address right so if they are not responding in a meeting or if they are not listening or if they are, uh, you know, ignoring the, you know, the suggested format that you have provided for how the report needs to be uh, submitted in terms of the status or, you know, whatever it is, then then I would I would definitely suggest that you, um, you know, have a, a one-on-one conversation with them in regards to, you know, this is this is performance that's needed, and this is the performance that's expected. And you know, sometimes you know it actually you know is a is a more direct conversation in terms of you know I'm getting the feeling that you're thinking blah blah blah. You know, is that right? You know, and sometimes it's putting it out in the open, but in a private one-on-one situation that allows them to share, you know, well, I think I should be running this or I think you're doing it the wrong way or whatever. You don't necessarily have to agree with them, but sometimes giving people the opportunity to voice what they're, what they're feeling and uh, what they're thinking and you're, you know, acknowledging that and making whatever adjustments that you feel are appropriate because sometimes they actually may have some really good ideas um, will, will often diffuse the situation. So that's, the, those those are my you know general suggestions. I'm really sorry that we couldn't get the uh, the the phone um, conversation to work because we could have you know spoken a little bit more about some of the specifics of of the things that you're facing in that situation. And he says thanks. So I think unless someone else poses a question in the box that's urgent. We have come to the end of our time together. So again, well, I want to thank you for sharing your time with me today. Um, Again, this is, you know, clearly just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the the kinds of challenges and some of the, the, um, the, the resources that are available in terms of becoming a uh, effective or even a, even more effective supervisor. So we look forward to seeing you at other programs and on other uh, Procept webinars. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day. Bye.